Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Fresh Talent and Leadership Strategies to Deliver Future Ready Leaders and Teams. My name is Melissa, and I will be kicking things off for us today. Let's get started with some brief introductions. Our presenters today are Jessica Scon, who is the Chief Executive Officer at BTS, John Wiltshire, who is the VP of Talent Development at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and Claude Warder, who is the SVP and Principal at HCM Analyst here at Brandon Hall Group. A little bit about Jessica. Throughout her more than 20 year career at BTS, Jessica has pioneered the application of enterprise simulations for strategy execution, built the BTS leadership practice and delivered CEO and C-suite advisory in service of transformations. Jessica's client experience is primarily software and tech where she has helped clients lead and execute through growth pivots, strengthened their leadership culture, shifted from waterfall to agile, and from software to SaaS, including clients such as Microsoft, Salesforce.com, SAP, VMware, New Relic, Uber, Atlassian, Twitter, and others. John is a talent management executive with diverse global experience at major Fortune ranked organizations Citigroup, Ernst and Young, MetLife, and HSBC. He has proven expertise in talent acquisition, leadership development, strategic planning, and change management. He is currently the VP of Talent Development at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And John has collaborated with senior corporate executives, management committee members, and C-suite executives in addressing people development through creative design, development, and delivery of critical initiatives at enterprise and corporate business group levels. I would like to extend a thank you to BTS for sponsoring today's webinar. BTS is a consultancy specializing in the people side of strategy. For over three decades, they have been designing powerful experiences that have a profound and lasting impact on businesses and their people. Their next generation approach combines deep business knowledge with transformational development to help their people and their company evolve together and turn your strategy into results. BTS is also recognized at Brand as Brandon Hall Group Gold Smart Choice Preferred Provider. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, we are a research and analyst firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world through our research and tools. A quick mention that we have several certification programs currently open for enrollment, so please be sure to visit certification.brandonhall.com for more information. Your participation in our surveys is one of the most crucial components of our research. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics on this list, that you'd like to take a survey for, it's always greatly appreciated. Links will be available in your handout and you can always visit brandonhall.com for the latest list. And lastly, but certainly not least, a few logistics. To ask questions today, we ask that you please use the questions panel on your control bar. Today's, today's presentation is being recorded and we will share a link to the recording and a PDF of the presentation via email in roughly 24 hours. The chat is also open for today, so we invite you to join in on today's discussion, share your thoughts with our presenters as we go through the, the presentation, or simply pop in and say hello and let us know where you're calling in from today. And last but not least, if you would like to download a copy of today's presentation instantly, we will be dropping a link in the chat for everyone momentarily. And without any further delay, I will turn things over to Claude so we can dive right in. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We're excited to have this conversation. Thanks again to BTS for, for sponsoring. We're going to start out with some, uh, some research to kind of set the scene, kind of the current state of leadership development, and then go right into the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society story of transforming leadership uh, in their partnership with BTS. There's a lot of great lessons there and illustrations of how uh, leadership can be transformed and, and reinvented and with powerful results. And then uh, Jessica will be participating in that discussion as well, and then also share some frameworks for success in developing uh, future ready leaders and teams. And then at the end, we, we hope you'll give us some questions and some comments, as Melissa said, uh, along the way, but also we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So let's, let's get started. Um, 
you know, why we're here today is that I think we're, we're all together on this journey towards serving the leadership readiness puzzle, um, as, as I call it. And in today's dispersed and hybrid organization, great leadership has really never been in higher demand. And in my experience, leaders really have never been uh, more overwhelmed and, and more in need of, of development. Each year, leadership development is ranked as the top priority in our research and is listed as the uh, area of learning and development that gets the most investment in, in uh, time and money. Uh, for example, we've got a, a survey out in the field right now, our HCM 2023 survey, and 84% of organizations rated improving leadership development as critical or important in the coming year. And that ranks number one in the overall uh, HR priorities for 2023 so far, and that's followed closely also by team development, which is certainly related. However, and this is kind of why we're here, right, is the results organizations are getting did not really correlate very well with the level of investment and priority. Only 57%, as the slide showed, say their leaders are capable of driving business results in the next couple of years, and only 34% say leadership development is effective. Now, effective means different things to different organizations, but whatever their definition is, only a third believe they're, they're effective. So it's, it's clear that employers need new, innovative ideas to help prepare their leaders for the future. And that's why we're sharing this story today, because we think it's really illustrative of what a, a lot of organizations uh, can do to, to maybe improve the results that they have. Uh, we, we really want to make sure, though, that when we share the story that we're just not talking to you and that you can talk to us through the chat, give us your comments and ideas. We'll try to share some of those along the way. Uh, also handle some questions at the end. And I'd like to start off by uh, doing a quick poll and getting your input on, on this high level question. And it's, it's very simple. Uh, in general, how do you plan to develop more future ready leaders going forward? Are you looking at enhancing or expanding the programs you already have? Are you really thinking of more of a re reimagination or reshuffle of the leadership development programs to improve your results? Or are you planning really going into 2023, no substantive change in your approach? So we'd uh, love everybody to participate. I'm really interested in seeing what people have to say. I talk to people all the time. It's really a, a, quite a, a mixed bag. Um, and I think a lot of people want to change, but they feel that they maybe have some internal barriers. So this is great. So 81% of you are, are thinking about reimagining leadership development. Um, so I think you've come to the right place and hopefully you get some, some really good ideas um, and give us some really good questions and comments about, about your journey and what you're experiencing. So I think we can go ahead and close that. and. I have a few more research things to, to share and then we'll uh, uh, move forward. So I wanted to share a little bit more research to set the stage. You know, we do a lot of studies and uh, at Brandon Hall Group and what we've learned is that it's incredibly rare to get unanimous or near unanimous agreement on anything. So it's kind of startling to see that 97% of organizations we surveyed in our high potential talent study earlier this year said that they're planning to improve high potential development in the next one to two years. The other things that were, I think, worth noting is that only four in 10 employers believe that their processes for um, identifying and developing high potential leaders are not biased, meaning 60% believe that their processes are flawed when, in terms of and having biases in terms of how they operate. And then less than half, 48%, uh, to be specific, said that they invest in high potentials at the same level that employees want to uh, want to have. And so that also raises issues of talent retention, talent mobility, engagement that are important to address. So moving on, the, the next, the, the other thing that's really striking in our research is the breadth of skills and competencies that great majority, 70% or more of organizations say it is important or critical to improve. And this is probably a good reason why 
uh, many of you are looking to reinvent or reimagine is because so many skills are seen as not being taught in a way that leaders can drive business results and improve their, their behaviors and their effectiveness. So they really range, there's a wide range here. We won't go over all of them, but from managing change to collaboration, to strategic thinking, to team development, all of these uh, seven out of 10 organizations or more say need help. On the next slide, uh, what we also find is that some of the tools that our research shows, and I think uh, Jessica and John are gonna talk about this, uh, they're important for uh, helping leadership development programs along, is that very few organizations are using behavioral and capability assessments on a consistent uh, basis. Doesn't mean they don't use them at all, but they're not using them consistently or in a strategic way to help them understand uh, the strengths and growth areas of their leaders and potential gaps. And only 17% are using simulations or other forms of practice to observe uh, employees' abilities uh, after leadership training to uh, apply those skills in new and complex situations. In other words, really, really take what they've learned and, and be agile in how they uh, develop it and create new habits to drive business results. So, I've just got one more slide, and before I, I turn it over to, to John and Jessica, I'd like to ask you all a question, um, that uh, not a poll question, but if you could just throw some comments in, in the chat, and that would be, if you could just change one thing in your leadership development program, if you just had the ability to choose one thing, what would it be? What would the thing that you think needs to be addressed most urgently? And then we'll show you, uh, we asked a similar question in our research, We'll show you what came up in our research. So I'm seeing a succession plan is one. Anybody else have some things to budget, buy-in from senior leaders, uh, connecting the program beyond learning events? Yeah, that's a big one for a lot of people. Uh, more practical than theoretical alignment with strategy, more support again from leaders, buy-in from leaders. So there's a lot of that. So let, let's take a look at what our, our survey results and feel free to, to keep um, dropping the comments in. Um, so more comments on leadership, top leadership support. So the number one thing in our survey was, uh, and I think this you know, ties into a lot of what you're saying is they need, they want 88% want transitional, transformational leadership and change management. Uh, that they don't think there's nearly enough of that. Number two was, and this ties into your, the practic practicality of the training, scenarios to practice leadership skills along with real-time feedback from a coach. So not only practicing, but getting feedback so that they can grow from that and, and then practice some more and, and really build their skills. Number three was uh, creating networks and peer coaching either externally or internally within the organization. Uh, and I hear this a lot in interviews too, where uh, leaders really uh, value connecting with peers and sharing experiences and, and picking up pointers from people who are, are experiencing the same thing there. And then one-to-one uh, -one coaching with some facilitated group discussions. And fifth was uh, more of a focus. And I didn't see too much on this was uh, inclusion and diversity awareness. But I think uh, within these things, and I hear this in interviews, there's a lot too about um, leadership support from, from top executives and whether uh, they feel that there's enough, they have enough time to do what, uh, what the learning folks want to do with leadership development. So with that, hopefully that sets a good groundwork and I'll turn it over to Don and Jessica to, to tell the story of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and their transformation journey. Huh? Well, thank you, Claude, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've all seen movies where a person sets off on a new adventure, uh, and whether they're trying to save the world or win someone's heart, by the end of the journey, they're transformed into a better version of themselves, they become wiser, more capable, and ready for any kind of challenge. Good afternoon again. Uh, my name is John Wiltshire, the VP of Talent Development 
at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. It's an honor to share the stage here with uh, uh, BTS and Brandon Hall, and I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Though it's not a movie, a similar scenario played out at LLS. We had some challenges. Um, how do we enable the power skills of our revenue leaders? They're the ones who bring in the dollars to fund our mission. How do we work collaboratively as, 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 as units and teams? How do we increase the revenues? And, and how do we manage leadership in a, in a TikTok environment? Um, these are some of the challenges we had and the solution for it, um, sponsored by our senior executives was the Leadership Transformation Journey, an eight month series of events that involved over 50 revenue leaders with a common goal of addressing professional development and integrating learning into a final capstone simulation. This would allow them to play a much bigger role in our mission, which is to end blood cancer. Done in collaboration with BTS, it started with a kickoff event where each participant completed a self-assessment of where they stood among a range of leadership skills. And Claude just mentioned behavioral, understanding the, where you are with your behaviors. And while it was eye-opening for more participants, nobody anticipated just how much they would grow throughout this eight month journey. From confronting implicit bias and learning what, really, what it really means to be a people manager to developing better business acumen, each participant began adding to either new skills or enhancing some of their existing skills throughout this journey. We addressed a single skill with each workshop and we'll have an opportunity to see what that looks like. And each workshop was held every once a month or twice a month for the duration of the, of the, of the, of the journey. Participants naturally found themselves applying the new skills and insights into their work. By the time everyone came together for the final two days or two and a half days of the capstone event, it was clear that they had not just accumulated information and skills, but they had developed true capabilities that allowed them to develop strategies for winning donor dollars. After all, that's their role. Communicate these strategies by inspiring their teams and having action plans and be not only just having the action plans, but three, being able to execute on the plans. So in short, uh, across the transformation journey, everyone turned into better and more powerful versions of themselves uh, with the courage to take on more difficult situations and decision-making and a self-awareness for managing emotionally and challenging situations, all in the effort to be better revenue leaders and support our mission, which is to end blood cancer. Okay, so how did we accomplish this? Next slide, please. Leaders were guided through the process as they were introduced to new ways of thinking which included some of the tools and templates that assisted them in generating unique insights into leadership, provoking ways of thinking and helping them execute decisions in a simulated env environment. Look, it, it wasn't about being transactional, it was about being transformational. And all of the skills that Claude uh, presented earlier are the ones that you will see are the ones that we were looking to improve by practicing choices in an environment and observing best practice behaviors, the revenue leaders quickly experience the impact of their actions. So action and impact, 
and we saw that play out throughout the um, throughout the the simulation. They achieved better performance and were more safely and efficiently productive than they would have if they had been through on the job experimentation. We know the pitfalls that 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 comes with. So with BTS, we were able to collaboratively accomplish new operating language. So for example, we use Liz Wiseman's uh, multipliers. Uh, we use Daniel Goldman's uh, work. So people had new ways of, of working, new ways of language. So we were using things like in the box, out of the box. We use things like um, um, what worked well and what could be better if. We enable thinking and testing and tumbling in a simulated environment that incorporated all of the prior learnings from the eight months that they were uh, involved in the effort. And they participated in work-life situations and challenges and trade-offs that enable them to make sound and sometimes very difficult uh, decisions. So, what were the ingredients for success? And what I don't have, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what you don't see on, um, we should be uh, one slide back, please. The critical ingredients for success. Well, I, I will tell you what those are. Um, leader, the leadership transformation was an integral part of our leadership strategy. Uh, it required visionary thinking and the ability to manage complex issues facing the organization that fitted squarely into our leadership development structure. So we weren't just doing leadership transformation. We have a leadership hierarchy managed by a member of our team. Um, and that starts with manager essentials, emerging leaders, and then leadership transformation. So we had had a leadership transformation program that we have been in, that we had, that went into some hiatus, uh, but had been in effect since uh, 2017. What we did here was introduce the skills and behaviors and capabilities with go-dos and reflections. Um, we were able to embed learning and practices of the mindsets that we wanted the leaders to have and be able to demonstrate in order to lead their teams. We wanted to create a culture that supported change, built resilience in all leaders, and enhanced team motivation. After all, these leaders were not just individual contributors, they were leading other leaders as well. We gamified the experience and we made use of territories uh, and, and the national team to enable some of that um, competition among the teams. What is critical and what we, I, you, you don't see, but what was critical to the success of the program was having senior buy-in and enabling our leaders to have weekly meetings where we, they saw progress, they, they participated in each of the workshops that we did on a monthly basis. They were always engaged. So, Having said that, let's take a look at the journey. Um, thank you. So the journey was accomplished by dividing the map into a number of activities or waypoints. We had assessments and Claude talked about assessments uh, and behavioral assessments and, and do we do those? So we did behavioral assessments. We did knowledge events, we did skill events, and we finally had this culminating capstone event that brought all of this together. So in the assessments, there were two. At the very beginning of the journey, uh, and it allowed the, uh, the participants to identify some of the traits and gain some insights into their behavioral preferences. We couldn't do individual coaching, but we did group coaching on it that enabled them to examine 
uh, their preferences during coaching sessions. The second was done at the end of the journey prior to the capstone. And what we did there was uh, focused on change readiness. Both of these assessments were used within the final capstone. Okay, so we did assessments. We did knowledge. So we separated and understood, here are some things that we need to do for our leaders. So these took the form of three sessions. One was a session on uh, business acumen, and that was online, and that was developed by the team. We did an, an overview of philanthropy, and it was the first time our revenue leaders had seen what the, what the philanthropy strategy was for the organization. Now, picture this, we have several different campaigns. We have what's called Light the Night, we have TNT, we have um, other campaigns that um, all vying for donor dollars, and they have different models. And what we were able to do there was to come to the table with one consistent philanthropy model. The third thing that we did was around um, a volunteer uh, management and volunteer leader leadership. And then the magic, well, the magic started there, but more magic started happening. And the skills were represented by sessions designed to focus on the competencies and skills that address the professional development and that will be integrated into the final capstone. So one of the things I'm gonna preview with you is the capstone and most simulations focus on a scorecard and the numbers. And we said, no, they need to be focused also on the skills. And when we, when we assess and we reward, we would be doing that not just on the numbers, but on the, on the skills as well. And those were implicit bias. So we were dealing with some of the DEI issues, the role of the people manager. I mentioned Liz Wiseman and uh, being a, a diminisher or being uh, uh, working through and understanding your role as a maximizer, um, communication and feedback. And then we worked on delegation and emotional intelligence um, and the work of Daniel Goldman. We did pipeline, talent pipeline. So having leaders understand what are the roles you need to have in the pipeline in order to be a successful fundraiser. And we did influencing, understanding your role in influencing, not just the uh, people on your teams, but your peers and your, uh, and your volunteers. And then one of the things that we, we debated is, should we do a separate module on strategic thinking? And we said, that might best be done within the simulation. So within the simulation, we did exercises around strategic thinking and, and they had to make decisions about how they would run a region, okay. Let's take a look at how we gamified the process. Now, a lot of gamification can be very trite. A lot of gamification can take the form of things that don't relate to what they do. The, this was a key component of the program. Um, and what we are able to do is to make it very competitive um, in which the territory and national teams competed for points and badges and awards. Well, doing that requires some level of technology and we use the BTS Momenta platform to be able to display results, everything being transparent for all the users and, and, and the mem members of the planning team. So everyone knew where every point value was for everyone else on the team. So they could see total points, they can see progress against the awards. We utilize all mechanisms and strategies to make content exciting and appealing 
and appropriate to drive engagement, their learning and performance across the journey. I should say that a concern that we had was how do you sustain, how do you sustain engagement throughout eight months? And these are the things that we did to help get there. We're not, I'm gonna stay on that slide, the, the engagement slide, because there's something that I want to say that we took a step further in. We had a, an evening that was free, that we could say, well, let's use, and let, we said, well, let's use it and let's create the leadership transformation great race. So we developed an activity that allowed the teams to compete to earn additional points for solving clues, answering questions, of course, taking photos and videos, that was a part of it. But the major tasks were communication. So we had a minefield uh, exercise. We had a, a puzzle that where we tested delegation skills. We had another puzzle that enabled collaboration skills and teamwork. We took it to another level and we worked with a vendor partner called Widely Different. We thought it would just be a relief valve, but it turned out to be one of the most important aspects of the program. And because we included the skill sets within the great race, it worked uh, tremendously for us. Thank you, we can move on to the next slide now. So what did we do for the capstone event? As I said, the journey culminated with this multifaceted experience that incorporated all of the required learning and, and, and reinforced skills that we had been engaging in for the entire journey. The simulation experience, this is what BTS brought to the experience. It followed a do, reflect, apply methodology. So a lot of the activities, they had to do something, and you'll see, I would mention, they, there was a lot of reflection as well. Participants were primed prior to coming into the, the simulation with pre-work that was a case study for a region that they had to manage. And there was a financial refresher as well. So it wasn't just, here's the case, but there's financial information that they had to go through. In the sessions, uh, they participated in teams of four to five, and they were tasked with running a simulated LLS region. Now, picture in your mind that we have 27 regions across the US, and we have national, and we those regions are then broken into territory. So we had we broke people up so that they they could run an actual uh, an actual region run it meaning generating donor dollars for that region and they served as an executive team and competed against the other teams to drive the best scorecard but not just the looking at the scorecard but also looking at what are the behaviors they're using to do that? Are they delegating? Are they communicating? Are they using influence skills? And they had to present to the planning team their strategy and their skills. And we had to vote to let them know where they were. They conducted planning sessions where they took all of the available data about the region and the market in which they operated and formulated a strategy. They ran the region for a period. And before seeing any results of the simulation segment, they participated in plenary sessions where they took a deeper dive and they got more information on different topics and had executive dialogues and know-how sessions. John, Following these, yes. May I interrupt you for a minute? Because I, yes. I just wanna commend you and your team on something. And I, I wanna make sure that as 
practitioners in the field, we don't take something for granted. <laughs> so I, I, you know, in your in your lead up and then throughout this, I think what we're all hearing, you've used the word practice a bunch. You, you know, the the challenge you were facing, your leaders were facing is, okay, so go from transactional to transformative against all those topics, right? If I'm a leader, I'm like, okay, that seems like a lot. And what do you mean? And what does that actually look like in our regions trying to drive the revenue that we're trying to drive and all of that? And you said something earlier that I want to make sure people heard. You said, and we all know if we just leave it to happen on the job, it doesn't work, right? That was like the subtext that you said very quickly before you moved on to something else. And um, I just want to remind us all, if you look at any other high-performing organization or team on the planet outside of companies and organizations, any sports, symphony, dancers, chess, any one of them, what they all have in common is they practice a lot more than they perform. I don't know what the ratio is. Sometimes it's 95% you get to practice, 5% perform. Baseball maybe has the lowest practice to performance ratio because they play so many games, right? And that's, <laughs> and yet if you think about that, that's the sport that their percentage of success is low. Like they have a high failure rate, right? And all the batting statistics and so forth. So I just want to bring to our attention that I think it is absolutely absurd that companies and organizations don't recognize that if they want to have the highest performing leaders in the industry and a high performing culture and people that are high performing in roles, that they don't recognize the need to give them the chance to practice. And especially when leadership expectations are shifting or a company is evolving and transforming, it's a near impossibility to get people to lead differently, think differently, hold different beliefs about the firm, unless you give them the chance to, first of all, understand what in the world you're talking about, right? And what you did here is you made that experiential and real for them because you stuck them in the future state of what you're asking them to do, right? And then kind of the empathy to know, okay, now that I get it and I've gotten it because I've experienced it, now I need to practice it over multiple times with coaching, which you've also built into your design. Um, so I don't know if companies and organizations are catching up to how the military prepares their soldiers and how high performing athletes practice. But um, I think this is a great example of recognizing that. And I just wanted to call that out. Uh, uh, thank you, Jess. Um, that was one of the points that I did miss earlier. Um, because one of the things that we do, we never send any of our teams to the field or the pitch uh, without having some level of practice, but we do that with our, with our leaders. And, um, and we see the effects of it because then talent development gets, gets called in to say, you need to coach this person uh, because the person doesn't have the skills. Well, we never really gave them an opportunity to practice any of that. And this is exactly what we did with the leadership transformation. You know, John, um, <clears throat> in, in ahead, what, yeah, implicit in what you're saying, John, I, I, too, and what Jessica was saying, I just also want to draw more attention to is part of the reason to practice is to give people the ability to fail in a safe environment, um, you know, to make mistakes, to, to, to work their way through, through problems. And I, I, I just, other people may disagree, but I, I think, as you're learning, you're, you're going to make missteps. You're going to struggle a little bit, and, and to be able to do that in a safe environment, so that when you you go out in front of whoever you're you're, you're going uh, in front of, that uh, it's more polished and the the leader feels confident in that ability. So, Claude, a great book, and if everyone, and if no one has read it, I think you should uh, take the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm trains on the same track that I train at. So I, I feel <laughs> I feel somewhat close to Malcolm Gladwell, but read the tipping point. And that's where he talks about when does when when do you become expert at a skill? And you become expert at it from having devoted hours or uh, of practice of of time using that skill and our simulations and really help to do that. And I'm a strong proponent of the sessions that we conducted because we were able to debrief those, those sessions. We were able to compare performance of all the teams and armed with the know-how, they could then go back and help to make decisions. 
And we repeated this process and then came to um, uh, allow them to do some reflection and look at how they would commit to make taking actions as they moved forward. Um, I'm gonna uh, now just conclude with some thank yous because there is no way that we could have done this without, um, without our leadership uh, team and having a strong uh, committed leadership team. And we held them, we held them to their commitments. But in addition to that, or I should say, and in addition to that, the BTS team, um, Anthony Arufo, Maria Campillo, uh, Laura Hughes, and David Goggin made this come to life. And I, I would remi be remiss in if I didn't mention Janice Zasso Villardi, Kathy Louette, Rena Thorson, uh, Veronica belcher Alyssa Carswell, and Ali Renna who are on the team who are responsible for developing the content and making all of this come to life. As indicated earlier, across the LLS leadership transformation journey, everyone turned into more powerful versions of themselves, able to set strategy, present ideas in a fail safe environment. This is what we've been talking about, Claude. Have the courage to make difficult decisions and demonstrated a self-awareness to manage emotionally challenging situations, all in the effort to better, be better revenue leaders in the fight to support our mission, which is to end blood cancer. Claude, back to you. Yeah, great. Uh, we have another poll, but before we, we do that, we've, we've had some questions and I, th I think it might be good to handle some of them now, um, a few of them. So, uh, Sumit from India, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, it has a question and is it, the question is, and this could be both for John and Jessica, is it feasible that a, a simulated atmosphere can also stifle creativity or original thought? I thought that was an interesting question. It, depend, um, it depends on what moments or challenges the simulation is practicing or allowing a leader to experience. So it could be a, an unexpected macroeconomic issue and then the team or the person has to think through what would we do? And that would be kind of complete open mind, bring full creativity, think differently. So I, I, I would say you, you design simulations based on what the targeted outcome is. And it can be, it can to your point or to your worry, you might be teaching somebody high performance on a particular issue in which there's a prescribed kind of, this is what it looks like, right? On the other hand, you can use simulations to model out any number of unexpected events, um, issues that the company doesn't have an answer to, or to help people think creatively about anything from org design, financials, leadership styles. Um, so kind of just depends on the point. Uh, another question um, and that I think ties to a little bit what John was saying was, um, he mentioned he was thanking some of the people, the high level people in the organization. And to what degree were, I think they're looking for more detail, what degree were managers or leaders of leaders involved in, in being integrated and, and heavily involved in the whole training process? In other words, what role did the managers of the leaders have? Oh, I mean, that was, that's, that's a simple question. I mean, they they played a role in the planning. They played a role in the kickoff of every session that we had. They played a role in, in making decisions about the, the most minute details of the program. Uh, they, they, they reviewed content. Um, they ensured that their leaders were um, com continue to be engaged. So if we had a senior leader in the program that didn't seem to be pulling their weight, they were uh, actively involved in, in, in ensuring that the message got to everyone that they should be involved. So they were, you know, and at the simulation, it wasn't a BTS and talent development, it was BTS and, or senior leadership. Um, and we played, uh, talent development played almost second fiddle to the business and BTS and the simulation. 
If I can just add to that, Claude, one of your early statistics was some sad number, like 30 something percent of leadership development is seen as ineffective, or maybe it was the reverse, but it's bad news for us practitioners. Yes, 34 percent said it was effective. Yeah, it's bad news. And I, I think my experience in 20 something years of doing this is one of the reasons for that is a lack of appreciation of authorship as ownership. And particularly as, as, as it applies to what John just said, um, I would say allowing, ensuring, or mandating senior executives have a hand in authoring what's most important for their leaders to develop in terms of expectations, authoring the critical moments they want them to practice throughout the journey, authoring you know, and helping to write, here's our strategy and the inherent intentions of that. The, when we work with clients, when, they, uh, when you have a high degree of that authorship from them, naturally they start to own it, right? And then th they tend to shift their perspective too on, wow, this is more than just leadership development. This feels like strategy alignment as well. This feels like it's gonna be critical to our culture and our ability to execute. And I think the, what John just described in terms of the steps there was um, really important for that. Um, John, you, I've heard you say before that your execs went from kind of skeptics to believers. Would you say that that's because they were able to kind of co-design and co-author with us throughout the process? Or was there something else that also helped that shift? Well, I, you know, I, th th I thought I had heard this before. Authorship is uh, ownership. And I realized that we had heard it from uh, Anthony and and Dave, <laughs> so so the message uh, has trickled down really well. I, I you're right. Um, we did get them to be involved. I, I I think that a lot of our leaders came into the simulation thinking, okay, we'll get this over with and we'll be done with it, um, because we'd never done anything like it before. We'd never done anything where we engaged our leaders and had them. Um, now, looking at their leaders, so th these are leaders leading leaders, and those leaders are now bringing teams together and being collaborative in a way that they had not anticipated. Um, and I'll give you an example of one of the things that happened, uh, quite unexpected for us, <clears throat> and this may not be in terms of leadership, but we had developed all of these awards that we were going to give to uh, participants. Uh, individual awards and team awards. <clears throat> and the night before we had the awards presentation, a group of leaders came to us and said, we don't want any individual awards. This has been an experience where we have worked as a team and the individual awards then it, it negates the, the fact that we've worked as a team because we're now highlighting people. Well, we never gave out those awards. So if anyone would like to have an individual award, we still have a few. But what yeah. it did, it said that the team awards, the, the, the fact that the senior leaders were able to band together, the, 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 our executive leaders weighed in on all of these things. And we were able to, to, to have an experience that where we were able to pivot in a way that was totally unexpected, and one of the senior leaders came to me at the end. He said, I had no idea. And this has been a seminal event for, uh, for LLS because we've never done anything like this before. And it's been, it's been very successful. So these are uh, great questions, great discussion. Uh, we want to try to fit in a few more. Uh, we've got a couple from earlier. But let's do the poll question real quick. We'd love to get your input on this. And then Jessica's got a few things and then we'll, we'll try to fit in some more questions. Second question is, is just uh, to indicate which of the following you use or plan to use as part of your leadership development journey. So you can choose all that apply. Self-assessment, peer-to-peer learning and team activities, learning reinforcement, gamified uh, experiences, and the simulation or practice uh, that we've that we've been talking about. So just love to get uh, a sense of what percentage of you are using these kind of things, and uh, that, that that helps us for our research as well as uh, just kind of seeing where people are trending and if they're kind of going in the same direction as as John's team did. So we'll give people a few more seconds and then uh, we'll show the results and move on.
And here it is. So 77% are uh, using peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning or team activities. Uh, gamified experiencers are used the least, uh, which is pretty consistent from what we see. It's great to see that people are uh, beginning to use or are using simulation or practice. We, we obviously, based on our comments, think that that's super important. Uh, and then self-assessments, which we have a, a question that we'll get to before, before the end of, of the uh, presentation. So let's close that out now. And uh, Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. I know you wanted to share some, some ideas and, and thoughts. Well, I, I'm also sensitive to the few more questions in the Q&A, right? So maybe I'll, I'll just share one point here and then we can answer a few more of the questions. Um, what I, what I love about this slide is I think it summarizes John and his team's approach to senior leader development. Um, it's our view of both sides of the pyramid are needed for like world-class organizational execution, right? And I think what's, what we're trying to say here is that your culture and your strategy are either mutually reinforcing or they're simultaneously defeating. And, and world-class leadership development interventions, journeys, simulations, assessments, I think have to take both right? Um, both sides have to be included in that. And sometimes we see an over-rotation on the left, maybe with some of the, just of the softer skills. Other times we see companies make mistakes of just assuming if they create a strategy that'll actually get done, right? And they underinvest in the left-hand side. So I think what was great about what John designed was both the in-depth modules and the capstone simulation experience was balanced and that their executives were practicing actionable strategy creation, running a region, revenue generation skills, influencing skills and all of that. So I think that's, you know, I think uh, the muscle that we need as practitioners is to make sure that the work we're doing is, is pulling from both sides of the pyramid. Okay, let's, let's tackle a few more questions in the few minutes we have remaining. So one that was asked uh, earlier from uh, Valeria was, um, wanting some, some information from John, uh, what type of framework was used for your self-assessment? How did These, you go about building that? The, the self-assessments were, were taken from, uh, from, from BTS. Um, uh, and we tend to use a lot of self-assessments in some of the programs that we use. Um, uh, but in this instance, we used uh, we used BTS's uh, uh, two the two that were recommended by BTS. Uh, in we also use a lot of 360 assessments, uh, and we just completed a, a 360 assessment with coaching and and follow up for our top leaders within uh, within LLS. So this is this is a, a natural part of what we do in the organization. Just to add to that, I, I think you guys use the change ready leader one and, and yes. portrait, which gives somebody portrait, yeah, exactly. awareness around their strengths, right? Yes. But to answer Sumit's question, which is related to that, can a self-evaluation increase people's awareness because they feel more self-conscious afterwards? I would say yes. I mean, I know for myself, when I take um, self-evaluations, I'm I'm not only more reflective, but I'm I'm learning based on what's on the screen, right? So I'm like, oh, I never thought of it that way, or that's an interesting dimension that uh, I might have been unaware of, right? So I do think the experience of just going through one starts to increase awareness, but it's probably 10x more powerful to have somebody debrief it with you and, and be forced to get to even deeper self kind of realization and then a commitment based on it. Yes, total agree, total agreement. Here's a, another question from Lara, interested to know how you capture real behavior change or transformation after you go through a program like this. How do you, how do you measure it? How do you capture it? Not, not, not easily. Um, we looked at some behavior change. Behavior change doesn't happen overnight. And I, and, and I, I think that one of the things that uh, Claude may have said earlier is we expect to run programs um, and we do them one day and expect the person to go back to the, the same environment and be different. Uh, but the environment hasn't changed. So the things that we are looking at are what are the follow-ups we can do? Um, 
we are what is what are some of the the assessments that we can continue doing in asking questions in talking to the leaders in talking to the participants about uh, what their experience is, looking at the language that they are using when they uh, when they talk to um, to their their peers, when they talk to when they're in other groups, uh, and looking at some of those uh, looking at some of those variables, we do not expect it to happen overnight. And uh, I was speaking to one of my colleagues earlier, and we've seen some slippage in some areas as people um, go into um working with the right hand and working with the left and you go back to the dominance and that's why the assessments are so important to begin to say well you you are overcompensating or you're going back to the an old behavior uh being able to talk about those things uh, are very are very critical and that's why it was critical for us to not only include the the leaders not only the participants but the leaders were also able to participate in the simulation as well so that they can now be primed to look for what behaviors we were we were uh we would we, we were teaching in the programs um one more question then we'll we'll, we'll uh leave it to you to um oh here's another one uh let's try to get this in are you using your own leadership competencies and develop for your leaders which i assume means or somebody else's we uh, we use um, of course there's the Lominger competencies. Uh, we use the DDI competencies, um, and we have been using uh, competencies at different levels. So the way in which we structure our competencies, there are LLS uh, competencies, there are job family competencies, and then there are role competencies. But we use the DDI competencies. We are now talking about whether we continue to use those or use, you know, go to the Lominger. Uh, but we we uh, don't develop competencies competencies on our own. We have been using BDI. I can offer um, some thoughts on competencies. Um, I've seen a lot of organizations make mistakes with the adoption and usage of competencies. Um, there's, sometimes you see there's too many listed. It's too complicated. Below average, high. Um, it's not tied to the strategic direction of the firm and the executives don't understand them. <laughs> so I'm not saying that's what John and Tina have done, it is not, but I am saying there's been plenty of examples of, you know, these aren't working. Not that there's anything wrong with them, but that the way they've been adopted and institutionalized is not successful. So what we're seeing and what's been trending for the last years is um, kind of a recognition that, in, especially if a company is transforming or changing, that the executive team needs to write their most important leadership expectations. Usually those tend to be some, whatever is most important to the future direction of the firm and the strategy and what needs to shift culturally, that those expectations can simply set a high performance bar as opposed to multiple levels of complexity. And, um, that they be open to kind of evolve over time as the companies evolve, but they need to be as practical and clear as possible. Because again, if I start in a new company and someone says I have to collaborate, I can imagine all what that might look like. Um, and so a powerful tool or frame for making the competencies or leadership expectations come to life is write them in the expression of what are the moments the leaders are gonna face at your company on a monthly, weekly, or annual basis. And when you're forced to do that, you find real clarity around, okay, here's what they're doing in the meeting and here's what we want them to do and not to do. So I just offer that an advocate for practicality. That's a, a great place to end. And we're at the top of the hour and uh, I think it's been a great conversation. I wanna uh, let everyone know that uh, we're capturing all the questions. So if we didn't get to one uh, live, we will be passing these along to the presenters and hopefully we can respond to, to your question. So I, I want to thank BTS and uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and for, for uh, again, for sponsoring this and the great discussion. And all of you, the, the comments, the questions, uh, really important to get your viewpoint. And, and I hope it was really helpful for, to you all. So thank you to everyone. And we look forward to having you back for a, a future webinar. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.